Hello, and welcome to Pints and Courts, a show presented by Craft Beer Nation. Today is March 19th, 2015, and our guest this episode is Matt Rogers. He is the brewer at Old Mill Brew Pub in Lexington, South Carolina. Our show tonight is sponsored by our good friends at craftbeveragejobs.com. Check them out for jobs in the beer, wine, and coffee industries. We want you to stick around for our conversation with Matt, so get your beer in a glass and get comfortable. In fact, while the music is playing, now would be a perfect time to take a few seconds and subscribe to our YouTube, Stitcher, or iTunes channels. Time now for a look back at the last week in the craft beer industry. Pour a cold one and sit back for an all-new episode of Pints and Quartz, presented by Craft Beer Nation. All right, all right, all right. Our guest this week is Matt Rogers. Before we get to him, we've got Lola Laracy, Randy Gardner Jr., Charles Dunkley, myself, Matt Miller, and of course we have our, our venerable Ashley Bauer, certified Cicerone, good friend of, of, of all of ours, and she is on location sitting next to Matt Rogers. So I'd say how is everybody, but let's, uh, let's hear how Matt is tonight. Matt, thanks for joining us. Hey, hey, welcome. Thanks, guys, for having us. Uh, really enjoy being here tonight. All right. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, two of the main things you got going on in your life. Well, uh, you mean other than you know personal things, but your two business ventures <laughs> are uh, are brewing uh, at Old Mill uh, Brew Pub there in Lexington, which for those that know a little bit about South Carolina is just to the west of uh, Columbia. It's a suburb of Columbia, South Carolina. Right. And uh, I have been there, and I have had the food, but it was before uh, Matt had the brewing process all going. I, you, I think you were waiting on permits or something before you, you really could do everything there. But uh, tell us about some of the beers that you've got on tap and some of the, some of the process that you've gone through there to, to bring up the, the program. Well, I uh, found the perfect place to work over here at the Old Mill Brew Pub. I was actually working in a homebrew store up the road, a place called Keg Cowboy, for a, a couple years doing brewing classes and uh, beer kits. I was the... the kind of resident homebrew kit expert guy. Uh, I also ran a homebrew store um, uh, and a, a hop guard, hop farm up in Camden. Um, I've been growing ingredients for the local beer industry since 2006 and uh, just supplying a couple little local homebrew stores and, uh, and breweries. And these guys um, found me working at the homebrew store and really were into what I had going on. Um, I was really into sustainable agriculture and organic farming. And these guys are in a 1800s textile mill, and they're doing uh, uh, really cool beers. They wanted me to come in and kind of influence the, the the new beer stuff. So we have a we have a hydroelectric turbine that's on premise, and we're making all our own power. So we're off the grid with 100% free energy. And that really ties into what we're doing over at the farm and everything else that I've got going on. So it's really a, a nice little setup. Without so I, doubt, a I do remember seeing, quartz first. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I do remember seeing some uh, the water uh, off the railing out there. What's, the, uh, what's that body of water? What is that? It's called uh, uh, 12 Mile Creek that feeds the, the turbine. And we named one of our beers after it. It's our oatmeal porter. But... Um, yeah, we are all about trying to save energy and be sustainable as much as possible. We uh, we grow as many of the ingredients for our beers as, as we can at the farm and uh, try to save water wherever we can and just try to make it uh, less impactful on the environment as much as possible. What's on tap right now? Well, it always kind of changes, but right now we've got a new double IPA we just put on tap. I'm calling it Diddy Wad Dandy double IPA. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> is dry hopped with mosaic, equinox, and azaka hops, and it's got a lot of passion fruit, tropical, you know, mm. citrus kind of character. I really like it a lot. And it's fantastic. <laughs> We've got a pineapple kolsch on tap that's uh, been conditioned on blackened grilled pineapple. Um, we don't use any artificial ingredients or any extract flavorings or anything like that here. Everything's all natural, and I think that the beer sh underneath should show, you know, up front, and then the complementary flavors that we add to it, you know, are meant to back up the actual beer itself rather than be a, a pineapple beer. Uh, we've also got a toasted almond scotch ale that I've got on that I'm drinking right now. Uh, we we toasted the almonds at the ovens here at the brew pub, and then we aged on uh, Balmore 
uh, single malt scotch and let the almonds absorb all the scotch. So um, That's way of doing it. it's really a, a nice balanced uh, complimentary you know, flavor. It's a spin-off, an American version of a scotch ale. Well, except that scotch uh, ales don't usually... It's been our, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know, a traditional scotch ale is more simple than this. Uh, we like to use uh, bold flavors that people in America are going to be, you know, kind of taken back by, I guess. Um, we don't want to brew the, the same old stuff. So we take the original traditional beer and then we, we twist it a little bit. What's the uh, what's the size of the brewing system that you run, the brew house that you run? We're brewing on a three and a half barrel system. It's a steam jacketed, really sweet little setup. The reason uh, the brewery wasn't up and running when you came and checked it out was uh, we, I was out in Portland uh, buying all the equipment new. Uh, they built it for us specifically for our brew house, and we have a small little brew house in there. It's a tiny little footprint, but um, we make it work, and uh, we're able to brew. Uh, seasonal beers so we don't have any flagships the beers don't stay on tap all the time it's always something different you know it's because we only have two seven barrel fermenters and one seven barrel bright tank so we're really limited on our fermentation space but uh, we keep them keep them rotating and keep it keep it moving how are you how are you managing uh, how are you lagering a Kolsch then um, we, or do we you condition it you know uh, Kolsch is actually an ale but it's fermented at uh, cold temperatures yeah. So we let it condition for you know a period of up to up to a month uh, in the bright tank, kind of a um, combination of the primary fermenter and the bright tank. But we um, we age the pineapple during the conditioning phase. So um, we grill the pineapple, we get it to where it's black, and then we drop it in the fermenter and let it age for you know as long as we can. I was going to uh, say that really that that ties up a third of your of your fermenting process or fermenting sure space. Does. Yeah, we, we brew a full batch. We try to fill it, fermenter up as high as we can, and then we get it out of there as fast as we can. But we really want to let it uh, condition and clear up really nice before we ever put it into a keg. We don't filter any of our beers either. So I'm just surprised how, how brilliantly clear they come out with as little effort as we put into it. We cold crash our beers, and we just let them, let them do their thing. But it's got a lot of really touchy feeling here at this brew pub. It's probably we, we, a testament to your process, I would say. Like yeah, if you, um, if you can get clarity on beer, we uh, we pay a lot of attention to the little details, and um, I believe in using the best ingredients I can get. So um, I think that definitely has a lot to do with it. Good, healthy yeast is the biggest thing. Yeah. So then, so everything is done uh, for service on premise. Do you do you? Uh, I guess with three and a half barrels, you probably couldn't really keg and still be able to serve your locals. That's right. We uh, we would have a hard time distributing our beer around here. We uh, we're, we're pretty slammed here at the brew pub. We uh, go through all the beer that we were able to make, and uh, and right now we're we're happy doing that. Um, one day maybe we'll expand, but that's in the future. We're uh, we're still trying to trying to figure out what we're doing here with what we have. How how do you test a new recipe before you double batch and tie up a fermenter? You have a well, home brewing five gallon system. Yeah, well, I've got a 25-gallon homebrew system, but I uh, have been very avid in homebrewing for 10 years, and I used to work at a, another homebrew store before I opened my own homebrew store. It's actually right next door to the brew pub, uh, literally next door. So I'm able to uh, stay over there all day and do all my experimenting and all of my uh, researching and sit around and talk about beer and play around with recipes and new ingredients. And that's where I do all of my experimenting at the store. Sounds like the party is at Matt's house, is what it sounds like. He's, All the yeah. time. When I'm yeah. home. Do you, do you okay. have any beers that, that don't translate well from the smaller brewing to the um, larger brewing system? Well, sour beers uh, are kind of difficult to pull off uh, just because of the amount of time it takes and the ferment fermenters we have. We don't have a lot of oak barrels or any of that, so... We're able to make it work. I've I never I don't take no for an answer. And if someone comes into my store and says they want to make a certain kind of beer, I'm gonna help them find a way to make it. And I kind of take the same approach when it comes time to brew it over at the pub. I uh I love to use oak spirals and uh, just home brew style ingredients and on a larger scale to try to speed up the process a little bit or make it more accessible. So we really don't uh, limit ourselves to any any style of beer. 
um, the bigger high gravity beers also could take a little while to make. So it does limit us a little bit with our our turnover. You had that amazing beer with the bay leaves that was bad. You made it for our uh, girls' pint out homebrew uh, learning education history of beer class. That's what it was. The history of beer class. Mm-hmm. What what was that was a name like a. You remember that? That was the grew. It was a quit. Yes. A quit. Yes. Yeah, it's a Dutch beer from the 1300s. It's made with oats. Yeah. Oats and uh, it has a it's a gruit style beer. So yeah, we we play around with that kind of stuff and anything we can grow ourselves. We have wild rosemary and bay leaves growing outside the outside the brew pub. So we go out there and pick stuff and and I just love uh, beer history and uh, just teaching those brewing classes. Beer history classes are a lot of fun. So I brew the beers uh, specifically for the class and then we we drink them during the class. Just, just for the class. How long has your um has your hop yard been going? I've been operating since 2006. I started out okay. with 50 plants. Um, I was actually into sustainable farming and uh, homesteading. I wanted to see if it was possible to grow all the ingredients to make beer at the farm uh, without having to leave the farm. So uh, I actually grew barley, malted it, and kilned it. Grew oats, rye, wheat, everything. Uh, a lot of fruits. Uh, hops was the first thing I started with, but after that, you know, I just was kind of on a mission. But I uh, started out with 50 plants. Now I've got 600 plants. Uh, it's right at an acre, and uh, it's all organic. I've got all my hop rhizomes from an organic farm in Colorado. A good friend of mine has a farm called Rising Sun uh, in Paonia. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, they're... Uh, it's definitely a different climate here, but uh, we can make it work. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun as, as well. That's what I was about to ask you. What um what variety of hops are you growing out there? Because I know some hops only thrive in certain types of environments, right? Sure. Well, I didn't have a lot of information going into this, you know, as to what hops grow well in South Carolina because there's not a lot of people doing it. But uh, I started out growing Cascade because I've heard that they're very uh, tolerant of this type of climate. Um, I, there are hundreds of different varieties of hops that uh, that have yet to be tested in South Carolina, so there could be something that grows better, but right now I'm growing Cascade, Chinook, and Magnum. Uh, the Chinook is taking a second place to, sh- to Cascade, and the Magnum is a far third place. I've got about 50 plants of Magnum. But I'm just kind of experimenting. I've played with about 10 different varieties, and out of that, the Cascade and Chinook sen- seem to be doing the best. But so, I know there's another variety somewhere that I haven't tried yet. So are you able to supply, like, like I don't know how many homebrew supply stores there are in Colombia, but are you able to supply all of them with with your organic, organically grown hops, or you just kind of use one, your, your K Cowboy or whoever it is you um Yeah, you I, I could supply all the, all the stores in town. I, I kind of choose not to. I want to have them at my store only. Um, okay. My store is called Hopyard Brew Supply, and it was named after okay. the farm. But um, okay. I'm also supplying a couple other local breweries around town. People really enjoy using local ingredients as much as possible. Conquest Brewing, good friends of mine, they're brewing uh, a couple batches a year with the hops, and they're doing a lot of Randall events and um, just any excuse they can yeah. to use those new hops. Uh, the fresh, dank, you know, fresh hops that come straight from the farm. When I pick them that day and then swing by the brewery with a bucket full of hops, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they love it. It's kind of hard to turn it down. Yeah. I would love that smell. The soda company, too, with hops, right? Right. We've, uh, we, Cannonboro Soda Company down in Charleston, uh, they brew, they make really great soda, uh, craft soda. I gave up soda a long time ago, but I'll drink their stuff. And, uh, they make a ginger beer, they make, uh, a hop, what is it, uh, Lemon hop. Yeah, lemon hop. Lemon hop is the name of it. It's really tasty, uh, and it kind of bridges the gap between soda and craft beer, an IPA. Kind of gives you that nice resiny hop, oily character uh, that will kind of make you think of an IPA, but while you're drinking a soda. So it's it's pretty cool. So is is it like a hoppy sprite? <laughs> it is like a hoppy like a hoppy mellow yellow. Oh oh man. Oh man, I would love that. Heck yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize we were gonna have to do a soda night on a one of our <laughs> Hoppy soda, man, come on. I think it's definitely possible to start seeing hops showing up in soda. Oh yeah. In the future, it's just a, it, it's a complimentary flavor. Uh, people who enjoy hops in beer definitely are gonna enjoy it in soda too. So. 
Uh, I'm there's drinking, more than more than one application. I'm drinking a hoppy cider. Yeah. You can have a hoppy uh, cider. Yeah, why sure. not? Does can hops homebrew. translate into the tea as well? Or? Yeah. Sure. Yep. Uh, hop tea was actually the original use of hops. They were grown in Bavaria for monks because uh, they were trying to calm down their sexual urges a little bit. Hops act as a sexual suppressant and as a, oh. a sedative. Ah, oh, that explains, oh. that explains that so explains much. That explains <laughs> my life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a homebrew store up here that sells hop candy, so it's a Cascade candy. So it's, mm. yeah, yeah, that works. You know, Matt, you're talking about different varieties of of growing them. You're still a pretty young guy. Have you thought about trying to cross pollinate? You know, try and find a plant that's got uh, different characteristics, but cross it with Cascade that seems to really thrive so well in our climate. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm brewing over here at the pub, and I got the store running too, and I, I'm trying to run the farm at the same time. It's you a lot of work, and I really enjoy doing everything, but I don't know if I'm going to have time to start doing a cross-pollinating program. Um, I've been to farms where they're doing that, and it's so extensive. Uh, the work that goes into creating these new new types of hops is is mind-blowing. They, uh, they will plant up to 10,000 plants of one variety and breed it with another 10,000 plants of another variety, and then they'll take that and they'll reduce it down to a hundred plants, and then they'll take those and regrow those. It's a it's a five year process at least to to create a new variety of hops, wow. uh, and it takes a lot of effort and a lot of money to get these new breeds, you know, to where they are able to go out into the market. I mean, so I don't, you I don't know, you, you can that. always consider giving up sleep. I mean, you didn't, you know, there's always yeah. time for. That. <laughs> or you can just turn on the Barry White. Throw some hops in a dark room, close the door, and be like, just just make magic. Just whatever just happens, happens. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Come you back in, in a few hours. Done. Come back with something new and awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, what did you make? Oh. Y'all been busy. we got a whole Brady Bunch family here. Huh? Well, fortunately, I don't really have to mess with the hops too much. Growing them here in South Carolina definitely increases or changes the hop character a lot. Um, what I started out growing as Cascade is totally a different type of hop. Uh, just due to the soil and the sunlight and the type of water, the tawar, you know, has changed the hop. I wouldn't be able to call it a Cascade. If I were selling it to a brewery, I would tell them it's it started as Cascade, but it's something new now. I'm going to have to come up with my own name for them. I'm thinking Camden hops or something. Do you get the alpha acids tested? No, I um, I just use my hops for aroma and flavoring additions. We don't do them, use them for bittering, mm -hmm. so it's not as crucial to get the alpha acids, you know, dialed in. But uh, yeah, that's later on. We're such a small operation; it's really a niche market farm, and uh, I'm not trying to be a big production farm. I'm just trying to do something cool and different. Nice. But but in July, an, an acre worth of hops is a pretty substantial amount, right? Yeah, well, in the in the south, um, I'm getting about a quarter of the yield that you would get up in the Pacific Northwest. So, you know, for one plant, I might get a quarter to a half a pound dried hops, uh, 600 plants. I'm, you know, ending up with, you know, a couple hundred pounds of hops by the time it's all done. So, you know, that doesn't go as far as I'd like it to go. Um, maybe one day I'll expand the operation, but I gotta clone myself or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like you've got it all covered, and we'll, and we'll be anxious to check in with you in a few years and, and see uh, uh, if you're dead or if you've really done it and pulled it off. I, I'm guessing on the latter is probably how it's going to be. Uh, Randy, next time you're in, in Columbia, you need to get out there to uh, Lexington and check it out. I, I think I'm coming back for a meeting in a, like three months or something, but we'll see. No, no doubt about it, especially with those beers that you guys have on tap. That's, man, that, that sounds like some good. amazing stuff. Yeah, that yeah. pineapple colch in midsummer sounds like my jam right there. It's a good one. So, yeah. We're yeah. right on a big mill pond too, so sit on the patio and drink a pineapple colch when it's hot outside. It's really nice. And oh, the yeah. food at the pub was pretty good too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. A, I really it's enjoy nice, it. Or a nice all around experience. The parking was a little tough, but <laughs> maybe that's gotten better too. Yeah. Yeah, you're too popular, that's probably the problem. So sharing parking <laughs> with the Humber store. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, your own story. You're on your own problem. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to we're going to shift gears here and talk a little bit about news uh and some stories that we've got. I mean, really the the first thing, the main thing we want to talk about, well, not the main thing, but the first thing we want to talk about is uh Saver, 
which is a, uh, a beer special. <laughs> it's hard to call <laughs> this, it a festival. Let's just call it a, a, a. Well, this article from the Washington Post they called it a craft beer event. Event. I like that, Randy. And 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 that's the that's the best way to put it. Last year, Saber was in New York. Uh, this year, it's back in D.C. It's going to be from June 5th to the 6th at the National um, Building Museum. And I remember, I remember last year there was a lot of back and forth of people saying that uh, D.C. was a better beer town than New York because, like, Saver sells out in D.C. like in a, like a half hour after the tickets go on sale to the general public, whereas I don't even think New York sold Saver out. So, so there was a little beef between the two cities a little bit about which one was the which one was was the better beer town but non, nonetheless if if you haven't been to Saver it's a, it's it's a, a really well done event put on by um I think the American the um American Homebrew Association puts it on and um it's it's like a th- this year they're going to have what um 74 craft breweries. Each of them are going to bring two of their beers to DC, and they're going to pair it with hors d'oeuvres. So the 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 mm-hmm. festival is all about beer and food, mm-hmm. and pairing beer and food. So if you get these, ta- you you go to Savor, you're going to get unlimited sampling, right? So you can sample all the beers that you want. You can sample all the hors d'oeuvres that you want. So it's it's a really good time. I mean, you you got people who are going to go there with khakis and a button down. You got people you might end up standing in line next to somebody with a tuxedo on. So it's it's a it's a really well done event. You get a chance to get a lot of beers on tap that you wouldn't normally get here in DC. And the, but the thing is the tickets are a little a, a little steep. Just for general admission you're gonna pay hundred and thirty five dollars. Khaki you, pants and a beard. <laughs> there you go. I mean a lot of the guys there are brewers so you might get khaki khaki pants a work shirt, <laughs> and but a always a beard, beard song, and all always over the place. Always a beard. Mm-hmm. So, um, one hundred thirty-five dollars for general admission. One hundred and fifty-five dollars if you want to attend. Um, they have these educational salons, and they also have kind of like private tastings. So, if you want to attend one of those two, then you're gonna pay one hundred and fifty-five dollars for the ticket. My opinion: if you're gonna pay one thirty-five, okay. might as well pay one fifty-five and go yeah. whole hog on it. So it's going to be a good time. We're looking forward to it. Myself, Matt, Ashley, Gil are all going to be there. So um, look for something from us weekend of June 5th and 6th. And I'm sure Randy's. did you say, have you committed? Are you locked in? Are you going to wear a bow tie? Or is it, are you, you're speculating. I mean, if you want to see Randy Gardner Jr. in a bow tie, look at our saver pictures as we get ready. I'm thinking about going straight up seersucker, bow tie, Straw fedora, rocking it all the way out, man. Absolutely, man. I like it, styling. I'm gonna be that guy. You remember that one guy saving with the seersucker suit? Oh yeah. Maybe a cigar. Might be. Oh well, you probably can't smoke in the museum, but. Uh, <laughs> and a goblet. Two on one unlit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Randy's right. so cool, though. They'd let him. Let's transition <laughs> into Lola's um, uh, story. Story. Talk to us a little bit about some new heights. So we're going to talk about some figures, not not a beautiful figure, not nothing like that. We're just talking about mathematical figures. Still beautiful. Still yeah. beautiful, especially if you're a craft beer lover. Time um, produced an article. They got this information from the American Brewers Association, and craft beer production was up 42% last year. That's a big number. And Crack beer was 11% of all beer sales in the U.S. Think about that. All beer. Not not Miller, not anybody else like that. Craft beer. And craft beer sales rose 18% by volume, 22% in dollars. And get this. All beer overall in the U.S. just grew by half a percent. So half a percent for all beer? But craft beer was 18% of that, which means Miller's flat, craft beer's up here. Oh, and no, actually worse than flat, yeah, Lola. Miller's they're not losing, flat. Yeah. They're losing market share. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. I know. Yeah. They're scared. And another figure, um, the number of U.S. breweries since 2008 has more than doubled. There you go. So yeah. we're, 
That number scares me a little bit. The 11% is encouraging, but the doubling of breweries concerns me. Yeah. You know, that feels like a bubble. <laughs> yeah. It could be cuz 600 were last year, just 600, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's probably that's, that's still debatable. I mean, because I mean, you know, I've said this before when we when we had Kim Jordan on, you know, not everybody aspires to be a big production brewery. So if you want to open up and just be a small brewery that represents and serves your town, there's no reason why you can't do that in even in a saturated market on a nationwide level, right? If if the nation is saturated but your town isn't, boom. That if that's your niche, that's the way it was throughout history. Uh, Pre-prohibition, there were 3,000 breweries in the United mm. States. Okay. So you know, if you wanted a beer, you could had to go to your local tavern. You couldn't. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't get it from St. Louis if you lived in South Carolina. No yeah. ABC liquors. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's really, more breweries in planning phases right now, yeah. so it's just another big number there. Uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, it is. Everybody has a dream to open a brewery, so we're going to see how many of them uh, actually turn into breweries and how many of them last. Right. Well, how many people have a dream to open a brewery and how many of them have a dream to make a couple of bucks? So, you yeah. know, I don't know. Gonna last. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to... Yeah, the ones who are, I mean, your case exactly here. You guys aren't trying to be the next New Belgium. Mm -hmm. You're trying to make good beer that you can sell in your market to your to your people that, that come there. So do, do things uh, locally sourced, organically grown. You know, you you know, get a dang turbine in the river out there to make your own power. So, you know, do, do the right things, do those kind of things, and then people will buy it. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Matt, I'll, I'll say this too. So, so when, when you say bubble, that kind of implies that it's gonna pop, and then it's gonna be like a crash, right? But 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 I think I think that the the number of breweries out right now, even if it keeps grow keeps growing, I think just through natural attrition, the the sorry well the not as good guys are gonna get weeded out. It, it, only the strong will survive, right? So right. it's not gonna be a pop, and then we go from yeah. three thousand breweries to fifteen hundred. It's gonna, you know, it's gonna level itself out. I think. Yeah. When you think about it, you can say that about anything. You can say that about pizza places. I mean, no yeah. one goes, "Oh my God, there are 300 pizza places. The market's gonna burst." No, people yeah. always eat pizza. And and <laughs> one one last thing, uh, to to Lola's article, I, I think it's it's fair to point out that last year the definition of what a craft brewery is changed. So, so that that increase in production. Actually, we spoke about this earlier this week. In fact, in fact, I think you even said this. So I'm regurgitating what you said. This, uh, this, um, this increase in production could be largely due to, to now, like for example, Yingling is now considered a craft beer, right? And they brew a bunch of beer. So that increase in production can be attributed to the definition of craft beer changing. They, they don't just brew a bunch of beer. Well, they were two million barrels last year, right? Yeah, two they didn't have a fair amount. Yeah. <laughs> they do I. But Randy, that that's a good point. I mean, these numbers could be a little bit skewered because they're including people that maybe weren't included in 2008. So you've got to account for that. But you know, people don't take it as uh, looking at it as skewed statistics. Look at it as now they're recording those statistics. They're reporting those statistics more accurately. Is the way I look at it is is perhaps instead of looking as well, Yingling caused this big jump in this statistic this year. Well, maybe Yingling was should have been in there five years ago and shown the market to be a little bit stronger at that time. So, you know, um, and, and really as evidence, um, you know, su the Super Bowl ad where they where Budweiser came uh, railing on craft beer and trying to make us look bad. And then what was this story, uh, Randy Leffy? Yeah. So so that started with um, we got this article from this uh, from totallybeer.com and um. um AB InBev, well, InBev, or I don't know if you want to, AB InBev, they decided they're going to sink 100 million euros into four of their Belgian breweries and, uh, and, and grow them. But as a result, the Leffe Brewery is going to be now putting out an IPA. Of all things, out of Leffe, the last thing you would expect is for them to be putting out an IPA. And so you got the Belgian, the Belgian beer purists who are like, you know, this this should not be happening. You know, th this isn't what this is. This isn't a Belgian style of beer. This isn't what Belgian beer is about. You know, you're gonna bottle a beer that has a, a history of, you know, the beer that they bottle should be 
should have a history in Belgium. That's what the Belgian peers say. The craft beer enthusiasts are like, wow, you know, the fact that you got a Belgian brewery now wanting to brew IPAs proves that craft beer is only growing in in its in its popularity. So there's a little bit back and forth on on this topic. Um, I happen to fall into the category of this is only good for craft beer, um, and it ties into Lola's article because obviously the the uh, macro guys are losing market share to craft beer. So now they're doing things like resorting to having one of their Belgian breweries making an IPA so that they can try to remain relevant and, and try to stop the bleeding, so to say. So um, craft beer is only growing, and that's that's evident through, A, the Super Bowl ad where where it was a, a, a totally uncalled for, unprovoked attack on craft beer and craft beer drinkers. And, and secondly... A Belgian brewery starting to put out an IPA to try to be competitive with with, with craft beer. Yeah, that's well, awesome. Budweiser, Budweiser is like the MTV of the craft beer of the you know beer world. I think they're gonna do whatever's trendy, and they're trying to ride the wave, I guess. But in mm-hmm. the meantime, they're muddying up the water for the purists out there, and they're taking a pure thing and they're kind of turning it into something uh, commercialized and really, uh, really, uh, you know, kind of cheesy. Yeah. Really. yeah. yeah. And there's going to be a certain amount of people out there that are going to want the pure part of beer, but then there's going to be some people that just don't know any better. Right. Uh, they're going to think that that IPA getting made at Budweiser is going to be the same as any other craft beer, but it's being made by a robot uh, in some multi-million dollar facility, and it's not embodying what craft beer is really all about. Yeah. And, and you, you know, I, I like the metaphor you gave earlier when you said that they're that they're muddy in the water because I mean that's that's really what they're doing. They're muddy in the water and they're trying to. It's been their mo to confuse people who aren't exactly educated to what craft beer really is, i.e., Shock Top, right? I mean, people think Shock Top's craft beer. You look on that bottle, you don't see AB InBev anywhere on the bottle. So they're trying to confuse people. And deceive people, and once you start trying to deceive your customer, that's that's well, real. Are they poopy. are they trying to deceive, or are they just trying to take advantage of those that don't look closely? Well, they're brewing uh, uh, three one two from Goose Island is being made predominantly outside of Chicago. They're not even New York, Chicago anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much lying to your consumer. If you're yeah. if the label says the area code on the front of the bottle, it should be made in that area code, I believe. You would you would hope. Or if you own a craft, if you own a beer that you're marketing as craft beer, but your name isn't on it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think that's... I think the uh, sixth sign of the apocalypse will be coming this summer, summer of 2015. Rochefort 70 IBUs. <laughs> <laughs> Rochefort 70s IPA. <laughs> that will be the end of. You know, when the monks get into it, we know it's all over. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that uh, probably is going <laughs> to – that's probably going to cover the news. Was there one more thing we wanted to talk about? We, did we want to talk about uh, St. Patrick's Day real quick, Randy? Oh, yeah. So St. Patrick's Day, uh, Ireland, famous for Guinness, the uh, owner of a, of a brew pub, um, Gareth Cummins, had like a uh, Ask Me Anything segment or, or thread on Reddit. And I guess somebody asked him what was his most popular beer or his most popular beers being sold on St. Patrick's Day. Surprisingly, he didn't say Guinness. He said oh. found. He said founders, founders all day IPA. So <laughs> craft beer is on a terror, man. <laughs> it's in a green can, man. Yeah. It's a, it's in a green can. <laughs> and American craft beer. An American session IPA. Is one of the most popular St. Patrick's Day beers in rock Ireland. Rock on, rock on, America! Winning, yeah, that's this, awesome. Something tells me this was a hipster pub, but um, <laughs> nonetheless, it's an interesting story for sure. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm against, I'm not against green dye and beer. I think it should uh, be me too. illegal. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that really only results in green pee an hour later. I don't, I don't really know what. <laughs> What they're going for. Hey, we're going to shift gears real quick, and we're going to talk about our craft beverage job of the week. Uh, the show is sponsored by craftbeveragejobs.com. Uh, some really good folks over there uh, building a great job website. 
The job of the week this week is another sales job. This one is for uh, it's a sales specialist job for Flying Dog Brewery, which is not in Pittsburgh, but this is their uh, this this job is for their Pittsburgh, PA market. And I guess uh, if you want to get involved in the industry, you live in that area, or you want to live in that area, I'm you know I've been to Pittsburgh a good bit of a good bit of t- many times, let's say, and uh, I think you kind of have to live there to want to live there. But um, sorry, Pittsburgh. But um, <laughs> if you have absolutely no qualms walking into a, a, a store owner or a restaurant and saying, uh, would you like to buy a pearl necklace or a six-pack of Raging Bitch, um, perhaps this is the job for you. They, they do. I, I pick on the names, but the beer is pretty solid from them. True Gonzo. story. That's the, first, that's the first beer I ever did on a video podcast, Pearl Necklace. And pearl I love... Necklace? Yes. Yeah, they're oyster stout. Yeah. Yes. And I so, laughed so hard, and everyone laughed and laughed. <laughs> <laughs> it was a wonderful evening. True story. All right, we'll check that out on craftbeveragejobs.com. And uh, really, that, that's just about it. I think those guys are cool. We I've gotten to know them through our sponsorship with them, and they're they're trying really hard to put a, a great product out there. So, uh, so check that website out. The review of the week... Um, <laughs> it's going to tie into one of the releases, so maybe we'll do the releases and we'll come back to do the review. But uh, beer releases this week are Modern Times has got Barrel Aged Monster Park, uh, that's out on twenty on March twenty fifth. Does anybody know what kind of beer that is? I didn't look it up. I just saw the the release. Man, I'm like a deer with no eyes. Barrel aged. No yeah, idea. Barrel aged. All right, Star Hill, right here in Central Virginia. They've got King of Hop Imperial IPA coming out next week. Uh, they also are doing a. Uh, they're releasing a collaboration that they did with Breckenridge. Um, that's only going to be sold by the Breckenridge folks out there in in, Cal- in Colorado. Um, but their uh, Todd Usery is actually going to come to Star Hill this summer and brew a beer for them to release. So we'll. We'll look for a collaboration from them this year. North Coast is releasing uh, a new release of Acme California Pale Ale. I've actually had that pale ale before. It's not it's not bad. North Coast does a nice job. Uh, that's the brewery that puts out uh, Old Rasputin. So uh, I don't know why I said it in that voice. That wasn't Ooh. Russian at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> 21st <laughs> Amendment. We talked to Zambo about this one. Uh, Friday comes out the Down to Earth Session IPA. And that is the beer that, what did he say? They got the monkey, came down from space, and his, you guys remember what they said the monkey was doing on that can? I can't remember. No, so, I don't remember. So look for Down to Earth Session IPA on Friday. Trogues has got Flying Mouflon, an American barley wine brewed with hops. <laughs> I'm going to say this slow. A barley wine brewed with hops dipped in candy sugar and rolled in cocoa nibs. Mm. Mm. 9.3 uh, uh, alcohol by volume and 100 IBUs. That is going to be a complex, interesting beer. Uh, one of those I'd like to try. I don't know if I'd want to drink a big, tall glass of it, but it might be uh, something to sip on. Um, Otter Creek, uh, out of uh, where are they? They're New Hampshire or Vermont. They're in the north northeast somewhere up there. New England. New England. Let's call it New England. They've got an over easy session IPA. That's uh, that looks like a New Year uh, round beer for them. And um, uh, Oscar Blues and DC Brow. Have a collaboration called "Smells Like Freedom" or "Smells Like Freedom," and it is uh, celebrating the legalization laws passed in uh, the District of Columbia here the last couple of. I guess they passed it in a referendum, and then it they just kind of got upheld or something here. Um, so they are not arresting for growing, possessing something you just can't buy or sell marijuana in the in can, the district. You can own you can you can own up to two ounces for personal consumption, and you can have up to three mature plants. That sounds like a very discreet and a very a very accurate, uh, <laughs> and that comes out Monday. The last release, I'm going to come back and talk about that beer again. But the Almanac's got Farmer Farmers Reserve Strawberry coming out next week. But the Oscar Blues and DC Brew uh, Brow uh, collaboration, uh, it's no secret that many of us are big fans of DC Brow. Uh, DC Brow probably because we live close enough to get uh, a lot of their beers. I don't I don't think they have a, a large distribution footprint, but um, someone. I really wanted to do a review of this, uh, read a review for the review of the week of this this collaboration, and it's really just, I mean, just what yesterday or two days ago is when they're putting it on tap, and the only review I could find was an anonymous one on Beer Advocate, and I, I kind of thought it was fitting that it was anonymous because nobody, you know, the the marijuana tie-in, nobody wants to put their name on it, I guess, but um, here is their review. Uh, that surprises me a little bit. It says, not quite as dank smelling as the name would imply, but the mix of the three hops give it a unique fruity nose. 
I uh, has the sort of multi backbone you'd expect from a DC Brow Oscar Blues collaboration. Probably a touch more crystal malt than I pref- than I prefer, but the residual sweetness works well with the hop profile. Lots of citrus and tropical fruits, maybe some melon and mild pine. Definitely more fruity than herbaceous. That's my word of the day. I'm going to try and work herbaceous into my language, my everyday language tomorrow. <laughs> Drinks like a combo of Dales and On the Wings of Armageddon or Alpha Dominamelis. Medium bodied with the creaminess that takes the edge off the hops bitterness. One of DC Brow's better beers for sure. Plus or minus 7% is my sweet spot for IPAs, and it would be nice to see more of this from them. I have to interject here. I had a crawler of this beer on Saturday. I have a crawler of this beer upstairs. I got it at the brewery. DC Brown knows how to brew, brew beer. Oscar Blues knows how to brew beer. If they're going to try to make a beer that's intended to be dank, they're going to make a beer that's supposed to be dank. I'm kicking this review straight in the nuts and saying that whoever wrote it must not have had this beer because th- <laughs> this beer is dank as all get out. If you if you remember when Stone did the Enjoy By release that was devastatingly dank, yeah, you remember how dank that beer was. Yeah, this beer is danker than that. Okay, <laughs> so I don't know where they're talking about. They get all this all this fruit unless marijuana just became a fruit last week. Then this person <laughs> don't know what in the hell they're talking about. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Uh, Oscar Blues knows how to do it. I love that. Parent. Exactly, exactly. So. Dank and dank, huh? Yeah, and man, mo dank. <laughs> and then mo dank, all right. Dank is the dank. All right, uh, we'll wrap it up with festivals. Uh, Atlantic City Beer Festival, Charlotte, uh, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Did I need to tell you that? That's this weekend. Uh, Charlotte <laughs> Beer Week in Charlotte, North Carolina. Extreme Beer Fest in Boston, Massachusetts. Chicago Beer Festival. DC Beer Festival. At San Antonio Beer Week starts this weekend. And then one we're all excited about here, uh, probably none more excited to get it over with and enjoy it, is uh, Ashley Bauer. She is uh, a one member of an awesome group that are working there, took us off, um, to, to create this thing called Soda City Suds Week yes. uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. And I think Ashley is realizing how what a great idea it is to do, and then how much work it really is to put something like this together. Holy cow. I am looking forward to the week. I'm also looking forward to the week after. <laughs> well, you know, you've done all this work. Now you can imbibe. Uh, Old Mill, are they doing? Are you guys doing any event for Soda City Sud Week? We are. Yeah, we've got a beer that we brewed just for it with uh, Canterbury Beverage Company down in Charleston. It's the Ginger IPA. Made with uh, heaps and heaps of fresh grated fresh ginger, local ginger. Um, I did about five pounds of ginger per barrel. Wow. All right, we lost their audio, but uh, yeah. it went down in an awesome fashion too. So that it sounds like hair clippers, like I'm at the barber shop. Meow. But. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nope. No, we got you. We got you now. We got you back. You give it again. Oh, okay, good. So, yeah, 27 events throughout the week. We've got events all over town, Lexington, Columbia, Irmo. Um, all the breweries are a part of it, and then all the uh, a lot of the distributors that have great beers throughout North Carolina and South Carolina are a part of it. Yeah. Quick so, question. Yeah. Quick question. I'm sorry, Matt. No, Randy. Um, tall Matt, did you did you guys put um. Did you boil the ginger or did you age it on ginger? You uh, uh, put both, in a secondary. Well, I used the hop back. I ran ginger, uh, ran the beer through the hop back with a bunch of topaz hops, Australian topaz, uh, recirculated during the whirlpool, and then we used uh, a ton of ginger in the in the secondary fermentation. So you know after the beer had fermented. Roger that. Yep, fresh grated, great ginger, local organic good stuff. Sweet. Yeah. So if you're in Columbia, South Carolina, or want to go to Columbia, South Carolina, you're going to find a beer event this week. If you see Ashley Bauer, run up to her and ask her who they need to buy a beer for um, because uh, a lot of people put a lot of hours into this. And, and we're, uh, we're excited to see some pictures. Come to Google+, Plus, uh, come to our Facebook page, come to Twitter, and you'll see lots of Soda City cool stuff uh, yes. that we're retweeting this week. 
And so does CitySudsWeek.com. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And that was not a shameless plug because she has no shame. She has worked way too hard. Uh, that is it for this week. I'd like to thank Matt Rogers from Brew, uh, a Brew <laughs> Old Mill Brew Pub. Let's get the name right at least. Uh, check that out in Lexington, South Carolina. Sounds like some pretty awesome beers on tap. Uh, thanks to the panel for joining us. And really, I mean, just uh, until next week, find some great beers. Find some dank friends and mind those P's and Q's. This has been Pines and Quartz, brought to you by Craft Beer Nation. You can show your support for our podcast by subscribing to our content on YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, or our website, craftbeernation.org. Thanks for listening.